watch mark. Inflation is back. Well, it was one data point. Headline CPI rose 0.5% in January versus the expected 0.3%. But it does add to the narrative that we've been following over the last several sessions. U.S. stocks initially sold off on the news and they've since come back. We're just showing you uh, there. The Dow Jones higher by some seven tenths of one percent. The S&P 500 higher by 1.1. Meanwhile, Treasury yields are rising towards a four-year high. Our next guest says he doesn't see real inflation yet. Joining us now is David Bonson. He's chief investment officer and founder of the Bonson Group, a wealth management firm which oversees more than one billion dollars in assets. Great to have you with us. Great to be here. Not seeing signs of real inflation yet. No, I am seeing signs of more conversation around inflation, more more inflation <laughs> expectation dialogue. But as far as in the real data, it, it isn't there yet. That's not to say it won't come. But doesn't that create more inflation on its own? Inflation expectations begets inflation to some extent. I, I don't agree with that. I know a lot of people believe that, but there is sort of an almost ideological difference of opinion there. I believe inflation is inflation and it comes from too much money chasing too few goods, mm-hmm. as Milton Friedman taught us. And so I don't believe higher wages creates inflation. Mm-hmm. And I don't think anybody really seriously thinks that anymore. It can indicate inflation. It doesn't create inflation. What you do believe, though, is that we see enhanced volatility in 2018 versus 2017 and we've already had sure. a fair dose of that. What we didn't see, at least from your clients, was any sign of knee-jerk reaction and panic. No, it was kind of fascinating. I mean, it was very, very minimal in terms of the sort of client response. And you're talking about two days in a week, as you yes. know, with over a thousand point drop. Um, I would like to take some credit for it and think maybe we've done such a great job educating our clients. We don't have to deal with that anymore. But human nature is human nature. I really believe in this case, it was so violent and so quick. There almost wasn't the time to respond. And of course, there is just this sort of complacency that's been baked in over such an extended run of a very limited volatility. The people that got shook out last week, I'm convinced of this now that I've studied the money flows. They were very weak hands that I think had just come back in the market and got sh- shaken out. Real investors, I don't think, were affected. Right. What were you communicating to your clients then to, to keep them calm and not panicking? Um, well, for one thing, we're kind of constantly communicating these messages. Sure, but, and, but what, what but were you saying specifically? We, we were specifically showing the way that the flows were at the end of the day. It really kind of indicated significant ETF selling and mutual fund selling that would have sort of called for a more technical explanation than a fundamental one. So a market structure issue. Also. Market structure issue, technicals, and then of course reinforcing those timeless principles that we've had 60, and I had to go back and research this, 60 panic attacks since the financial crisis. Yes. And in all 60, it was a matter of one day or maybe two weeks before normalization mm-hmm. came in. So it was effective. So Gershon Distenfeld of um, AB told us in the past week that actually investors should be rotating out of equities into high yield because you get equity-like returns, but you've got better downside protection. Agree or disagree? Um, About as fervently disagree as one (laughs) could could possibly do. I thought you would. Yes. I think at this point, it's the exact opposite. Take risk out of your credit portfolio. Take risk out of your bond portfolio. We have interest rate risk already. Just be content to have that risk. Duration risk because your bonds act like bonds, but don't let equity risk creep into the bond portfolio. So we brought the high yield way down. We'll keep our equity risk in our equities. Yeah. You mentioned that we had 60 of these instances Mm -hmm. since the financial crisis, and maybe some of them would last a day, a couple of hours, maybe one to two weeks. We spoke with Binky Chada of Deutsche Bank Mm -hmm. yesterday to get his sense of a timeline. Listen to what he said. Mm Given that volatility has arisen and volatility, especially trailing volatility, is an input into you know many people's uh, risk management models, when vol moves up, it tends to last a while. So I would say another five to six weeks before you know we get back to where we were. So what could drag this out to five or six weeks? Um, I think follow on empirical evidence that makes it more of a fundamental story than just a technical breakdown. And the indication since Friday afternoon is that this is a bit different. We had that major reversal late Friday. I, I don't want to speak with any conviction about what would happen in five days necessarily, but there's plenty of data that would contradict what he said. Brexit sticks out because this was the perception of a fundamental event, a major geopolitical kind of paradigm shift in the global economic environment. You had two days days, thousand point drop, you had three days, thousand point increase, and that was the end of it. And so I think that where uh, the VIX gets uh, in backwardation and volatility so extremely dislocated, there's all kinds of different precedents. There's no precedent for it lasting more than a couple months, mm. 
And as a matter of fact, I think uh, 90 days, 100% of the time, you've gone back to normal in the last five incidents. This is the perfect segue as well when you mentioned things like the financial crisis and yeah. Brexit, in fact, to bring up your book, yeah. which I'm working my way through, Crisis of Responsibility. And you talk about this, the culture of... of a blame game, an addiction to blaming, and actually how we stop this, how we cure what's going on in society as far as the sort of blame game. And we talk about the rise of political leaders as well. This country is an example of that as a result. How do you cure it? Well, I, I think one of the things I kind of get to in the book is that the only way you can believe that government and policy is going to be the cure to all the problems is if you believe they were the cause to all the problems, and we have to stop believing that they're the cause to all the problems. There's such a cultural epidemic, such a bottom-up issue, I think, around character, around responsibility, that once you've kind of come to terms with the fact that there are different causations to our problems than just whatever your political and almost tribal instinct mm -hmm. wants to think, that that then you can't assert that those things are going to be the cure to the problem either. Politics is just a symptom. Absolutely. It's a symptom of a broader cultural narrative. And right now, I think that uh, the point I make in the book is that the right and the left both seem to be uh, in this same blame game, just different bogeymen. Yeah, They've chosen yeah. different culprits. But uh, I want to make this sort of an apolitical conversation and, and encourage people to come back to taking responsibility for their own lives and families. Yeah, yeah I'm enjoying it. <laughs> it's a really great theme. And uh, don't be fooled by Scaramucci and Kudlow giving blurbs because there's a lot to learn from for the lefties as well. Yeah. All right. Thank you to David Bonson, founder of the Bonson Group.